Hi everyone, welcome to Curious Combos. Tonight we've got Rachel Lofthouse. She's a professor of teacher education in the Carnegie School of Education at Leeds Beckett University. She's a director of Collective Ed, which is the Centre for Mentoring, Coaching and Professional Learning. She's a former secondary teacher and middle leader. Rachel is also a teacher educator, a researcher at Newcastle University. Her research relates to creating opportunities for teachers to experience success through professional learning. Thanks for joining us today, Rachel. It's lovely to be here, thank you. We also have Rose blackman Hegman, who has spent the majority of her professional life working in education and has experience in leadership and organisational development, as well as a coach, consultant and trainer. She's formerly a secondary school head teacher and a director for a large educational charity in the UK. We welcome also Rose, thanks for joining us. Hey, thanks, good to be here. So let's start the conversation. Rachel, do you wanna share a little bit of your background and where you came into this, the area of coaching? Uh, yes, as you've said, I used to be a secondary teacher, but it's going back quite a long time now. But it was an interesting time to be a secondary teacher because we were uh, given perhaps a little bit more license to develop curriculum, to develop pedagogy than we, than we see some secondary teachers having the chance to now. And we also had opportunities to engage with quite innovative research at the time. So my first experience of coaching was through research projects. My first experience of mentoring was through being a mentor for student teachers. Okay, Rachel, that's really interesting. One of the things that um, I've been thinking about when, because we, we chat and we don't always chat about coaching. We chat about how we're going to do various things through Collective Ed, what we're doing through Growth Coaching International, but we don't often talk about how we got to where we are now. And one of the things that I, I've been thinking about, and I knew that you had a history, um, geography, wasn't it, that you taught. Um, and where you really started to feel personally that coaching and mentoring was the journey that you wanted to go down? Um, it, it was very much about the opportunities that were available to engage with the university. So at the time I was working in the northeast of England. Um, I had been a student teacher at Newcastle University. I then went to work in schools in the northeast of England and maintained a connection with my former PGC E tutor and he um, is a, a lovely man called David Leet, now Professor David Leet, and he he always uh, was exceptionally good at maintaining communities of geography teachers, informal communities as well as more formal project communities based around um, the uh, uh, based around curriculum development, and as a result of being part of those communities, it became obvious that it was um, an, an, an interesting opportunity was to support student teachers. So the first entry into this work really was as a mentor and working alongside a number of student teachers over a number of years gave me a real insight into the fact that none of them are clones when they enter and we don't want them to become clones as teachers. We want them to be themselves. We want them to develop a whole suite of a pedagogic repertoire, but we want their personality, we want their lives to kind of come alive through teaching. And mentoring is one of the ways that you, that you develop the conversations that allows them to personalize their work. Yes, as a mentor, you're working and helping them work towards a set of standards, but you're also very much thinking about who they are and what they can contribute and what their journey is likely to be through education. So that was my first experience of mentoring. Okay, so um, I mean, I, I guess that, that, that my, my thought immediately goes to, so you started off really early on in your career about an interest in this through the, through the mentoring side as opposed to the, the coaching side, I guess, from, from what I'm hearing here. Mm -hmm. So in terms of how your practice has developed and, and broadened out into coaching, so did you have training early on other than, than what you've just described there? Was it was yeah, there so space? Yeah, so, that, so I was in a really fortunate position, again, being part of this community of teachers in the Northeast um, associated with Newcastle University, um, an opportunity came up to work in a research project. So it was, it was a school-based consortium research project and it was funded uh, quite well. And what it allowed um, 
a group of teachers to do was engage over a period of time with researchers at Newcastle University to focus on teaching thinking skills and it, it, you know, to really think about the metacognitive processes underpinning teaching and learning. And one of the mechanisms that we focused on teaching thinking skills was by developing um, a group of teachers as coaches. So we had some training through that project about pedagogic coaching, about supporting teachers to look carefully, critically at their own practice, to engage in conversation that allowed for an exploration of ideas, a sharing of ideas, reflective conversations about teaching and learning. And that, um, that coaching was the first opportunity I had to work as a coach. I was one of those teachers who was um, able to be trained as a coach and then work as a coach within the project. As the project came to an end, <coughs> I moved into working as the PGC tutor at Newcastle University. So I, it was a really interesting transition from being a teacher and being a coach in my school to becoming a PGC tutor. Because one of the things I was able to bring into the role of PGC tutor was the nature of these really productive conversations around pedagogy. And I think that helped to inform both the way that I worked with cohorts of students, mm. but also the way that I worked with them when I went to see them teaching, um, talk to them about their teaching and how it was developing over time and also the way that I worked with the mentors that I then had responsibility for um, to support my student teachers. So it was, um, coaching wasn't on the horizon when I became a teacher, it was through this research project and the training to be a coach and the experience of being a coach that it became something that um, I gained more experience of. I'm not an, I'm not an experienced coach but I have experience of coaching and I have used that experience to if you're underpin some of my future work as a teacher educator. Okay so thank you to the audience that we've got here today and there's a number of educators who are listening and certainly in my experience of when I was in school and both as a teacher and as a, as a middle leader and later, later as a head the, the, the mentoring coaching element within a school traditionally, in my experience, has been through those that have taken on that role of mentoring, say NQTs or, or first year teachers. And you described there a very specific project about where you were with a particular university and you were in a position where that was able to happen. So for those that are listening to this conversation and certainly again, a question from my own experience, if, if one hasn't got that access to that type of project, one hasn't got that um, relationship with a university in that way, um, and wants to think about coaching and mentoring, you're currently working out in schools now through your research. What other ways do people get involved in coaching and mentoring within schools if they aren't associated with a particular university and aren't able to access it in the way that you describe? I think that's a really interesting question. And I think, um, inevitably, things become fads and if you like, they become on trend in education. Um, you know, we're, we're people and we like to, we like to know, what's, um, you know what's bubbling up out there in the landscape, what we might attach ourselves to. And coaching is one of those things, I think, which in, in England anyway, has come and gone in and out of fashion a little bit. Um, and it's, it's, for me, uh, thinking about how teachers, school leaders might engage with it now, there's, there's kind of multiple routes in. So it may be, for example, that they're part of um, a leadership training programme and they are offered coaching as part of that training. Okay. And then they begin to understand how coaching conversations can be really formative, can help them to unpick some of their underpinning beliefs, to think forward into new practices, start to engage differently as a professional. And sometimes it's that experience of being coached which entices people to gain experience as a coach and to look for training or to look for academic qualifications or to, to read more widely in this field. So sometimes that's the way in. I think that's a very, very typical common way in. Another thing I think which often happens in schools is that um, schools are always looking for ways to invigorate their work and to drive a development plan. Um, and, you know, even if we can imagine for a moment that we can disregard some of the, the targets and the performance measures and the anxieties that those working in schools feel about the, those measures, there is still an innate 
willingness and desire to feel that you're doing the best job you can possibly do for the children and young people that you're teaching and the, and the knowledge that you can only do that through really empowering your staff to do the best job that they can do. So coaching can become something that is driven by this general need to support development overall. And again, what, what school leaders then often do is they, they look for opportunities to upskill colleagues. And it might be that they, they identify a small team of colleagues that they want to train as coaches so that they can go on and train with others. But also, there are some schools where the, uh, the ideal is that everybody acts as a coach, but is also coached. They feel like we create um, a, a coaching type culture. And there are lots of ways in. I think one of the, the issues of many ways in is the extent to which there is a, an agreed purpose. So we're not doing coaching or mentoring because we feel we should add coaching and or mentoring to our development plan and then have a system that can demonstrate that we're doing it. So that if anybody asks us, how's the development work going, we can say, well, we've got 10 coaches and between them, they're coaching 20 people this term. The, the question for me is, but why? Why are they coaching 20 people this term? What is, what is the overall project that they're part of? Is this just another activity that keeps people busy? Is this just another job or role that people can add to their CV? Or is there some grounded purpose that exists within that setting that allows people to make sense of the work they're doing and to understand how to rationalize the efficacy of that work? Because actually there has to be a purpose. Yeah, and I guess that actually brings me very much to mind um, something that, that Christian or, or often says it, it, and it resonates with me is that if coaching is the answer, what is the question? And I think that is, is sort of sums up to a certain extent saying you can't, you can't just have it, there has to be a purpose for it. Uh, can I just ask you a question, Rose, whilst we're here? Because I think, you know, you, you've got the experience I haven't got as a head teacher. Okay. So when you've been a senior leader or a head teacher in schools, hmm. when you've had the opportunity to introduce coaching, have you chosen to introduce it? And how have you chosen to introduce it and why? Oh, gosh, well, that's, a, that's a challenging question. Cause <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, that's the whole, yeah. So diff different contexts, really. I think if, if I can maybe say that the, the, the first point of where I realized that coaching was a really useful tool within, within a, a, an informal setting of in, in school was when I was a deputy and I had a head teacher at the time who was really, um, he had a very structured meeting sy system with his senior leaders. And we used to go in and he always used to, he didn't really talk about the way that he approached the conversation, but he would have um, a notebook and he would be always digging deeper and asking questions. And as I gained in confidence, I remember, I remember challenging him. He, was, he really was a great role model and said, you know, tell me why, why we had the conversation structured in this way. And he then started talking about coaching and started saying this is the way that he always tried to develop those conversations with the senior leaders. So it was more of a dialogue as opposed to a, a holding to account in, 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 a, in a more um, performance management sort of way. So that sort of got me starting to think about coaching. And it, it was through, <coughs> excuse me, through some work that I did early on uh, with middle leaders that I started to introducing coaching in the way that I worked, but not in a formal way. So I didn't actually have any formal training in coaching until quite late on in my career um, when I was a head teacher. And one of the reasons I did that was because I picked up, I guess, what you are, you are, um, indicated in what how you said coaching can come into school so through a leadership program or through an understanding of a personal desire to be able to to extend one's own skill base i never introduced a coaching program when i was um, a head teacher in in school and, and part of that was around not really knowing how to um, so one of the things that i really used to enjoy as a head which um <laughs> it's a bit more about, about my organizational skills than anything else, but I used to really enjoy putting the school development plan together and seeing how that was embedded across the, the, the vision and the mission of what we were trying to achieve. And one of those things was, was how, how is that going to happen? How are you going to implement that and ultimately have an impact on the children? And I think certainly in part of the work that I do with, with growth coaching now, that is really fundamental to how, how I operate and how I think it has to be, it has to be student centered. So therefore, 
as a head, I was thinking, well, if I'm doing these things to improve the outcomes for students, what is the vehicle to make that, enable that to happen? Um, putting that in as a strand of developing a senior leadership team through coaching wasn't, wasn't part of the educational BuzzFeed conversation at that time. It was very much on the outskirts of um, looking at um, supporting leadership programs through the NQT programs that, that we've, already, we've already mentioned here. So in terms of me doing something formal for the way that I worked within the school, no, I didn't. Um, it makes me think, looking back in hindsight, that maybe that was a bit of a short, a short-sighted thing and maybe we should have tried to do that back at the time. But I don't think there was such an open um, appetite for coaching in the way that we see it in schools now. Um, and I think one of the things that, that really resonates to me about it is this question around um, how do you introduce coaching within school alongside what you have as your performance management and the tensions that lie between those two yeah. and I, I think th a lot of, yeah. of conflict around that and I don't and I haven't yet seen that go away I think people are developing some really innovative ideas and practices in a number of schools and multi-academy trusts for example where there's and there is license to to work in a way that works for you. You know, we, we often worry about how how um, tightly controlled our education systems are. But actually, you know, there's plenty of there is plenty of rigor room. I think we see people developing innovation. Um, but I think that tension between performance management and coaching hasn't yet gone away. The anxiety that people feel um, about those two things, because and I and I and I'm always curious as to how people start to resolve that but i'm also curious as to why the tension exists because we can blame a system but we can also look at well what is it that individuals bring to that system mm -hmm. one of the things i remember talking uh, writing about a while ago um in a fairly informal way i think it was a blog probably was um the fact that you know most of the people who would be acting as coaches in schools whether they were internal to their school or coming into the school, but with a very strong education background, their first experience of the sorts of conversations that we might have as coaches is through mentoring, certainly in England. So that, that those occasions where you sit down with one other person and talk about your work, the first experience you have of that is as a student teacher or an early career teacher when somebody is mentoring you. And those mentoring conversations come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, lots of different flavors, you know, they're not, they, they don't work to a template. But there is almost always inevitably within mentoring a sense that somebody is needing to prove to themselves or the organization that they are capable and competent. So either against a set of standards like the qualified teacher standards in, the UK, in, in England or against some um, standard for a, a role that they've taken on, a kind of template standard for the role they've taken on. It's a new head of department or it's a new head of year. And they might be being mentored by somebody who's got that experience. And there's that anxiety always about the need within those conversations to both pr prove yourself and be able to make fair judgment about whether somebody is or isn't make, making the progress or meeting the standards or fulfilling the criteria for that role. And what I was very aware of is that when we first work with teachers to become coaches, for example, we are putting them in a situation which at its heart feels familiar because they have experience of working one to one, either as a mentor or as a mentee, maybe both. And mm -hmm. actually they need to shift their thinking and that so it's not enough to say the system holds us back because the system brings the structures performance management, the, the targets, the, et cetera, et cetera. It's actually sometimes ourselves that hold us back. So that opportunity to really reflect on how you make the journey between mentoring and coaching, if that's your background. Sure. Yeah, I, I, something jumps into my mind now as you, whilst you're talking in terms of when you, when, and it's interesting how, how my own thinking is going, and I'm not sure how, how the audience um, it, it picks this up in their own experiences in school. But when you asked me about my experiences of putting coaching in as, as a head, I automatically went to think about coaching one-to-one -one and developing um, the leadership side of coaching. And whilst you were talking, I think, well, hang on a minute, Rose, we had learning communities within school where we introduced having, just as you're describing, where it wasn't performance manager. So we had, we had a, um, a, a leadership champion, an educated champion rather, not leadership. So there was an individual who was allocated a role 
that volunteered and they had um, expertise in a particular um, skill within a teaching skill. So some kind of pedagogical focus that they were particularly great at. And they did the traditional, um, many different varieties of this, but a learning community where they would go in and work with a particular teacher and there might be a, a triad of three that were doing it with one of those learning educators. And that was really focused upon the coaching and the mentoring of the skill-based um, as opposed to <clears throat> looking at what they're not doing right to fulfill a, a checklist of, of standards that would then have a performance management outcome at the end of it. And I think that the, one of the things that we found really difficult when we introduced that was the tension between people understanding the difference and the trust around, well, if I show that I'm vulnerable here and I'm sure that I'm weak here, I, it, that person might talk to my line manager who's in the staff from the next day and tell them, oh, so-and-so, so, Rose didn't do so good on this part. You know, I think you need to be really mindful of, might have been that explicit, or there might have been some subtle coffee cooler conversations where they're actually saying things about um, their performance that is actually feeding through and it was not meant to be done in, in that light, if you like. Um, so I think that that's, that tension is is ongoing and i i don't know have you had any thoughts or any experiences in the research you've done about how you can marry those two together um working with schools a few years ago one of the decisions that schools made um, when when this tension was if you like foregrounded um was to recognize that it is very difficult to separate out all of the kind of the, if you like, all of the practices and processes that go on for individual and collective groups of staff in a school you know they do they do weave in and out of each other and that's both formally and informally but trying to set up some um kind of shared protocols protocols always sound quite forced and quite formal but an understanding shared understanding was critical so for example um it we worked i worked with a number of schools where a decision was taken and and you know they aimed to uphold the decision um, that if the um, if the teacher, for example, if the teacher was being coached in relation to their teaching, which was common, um, if they wanted to bring evidence of that coaching and the outcomes of that coaching, so either details of the conversations they'd had, how they'd amended and adapted and, and changed their repertoire, developed their practice, what they could see as changed outcomes for young people, if they wanted to bring that into a performance management conversation with their line manager, that was entirely legitimate because that was a significant part of the way they were developing, the way they were understanding their work. But what wasn't legitimate was for the, for the line manager undertaking a performance management review to question that, with that you know, to initiate that question. So again, it takes a bit of, you know, you have to get your mind into this kind of pattern of behaviours. But, you know, why wouldn't you want to celebrate the things that were working well as a result of coaching and bring that with you into the more formal performance management structure? Why wouldn't you want to say, this is what I'm working on with my coach? You know, I'll come back and talk to you about it another time. But it's, it's the ownership and it's the sense that we trust the professional who's receiving the coaching, who's experiencing the coaching to own the process and take that ownership beyond O only take that beyond the confines of the coaching if they choose to that i think is quite critical okay so would would you say then that the one of the key fundamentals to make this successful is that that the either a, a group within a department of faculty or even a wider school community need to take this on board to have these agreed parameters uh, whatever language they feel comfortable using to implement this to be successful is it possible i guess i'm asking to do this in pockets within a school or does it have to be a, a cultural shift to embed this to enable that to happen that's a really interesting question um, and I guess I, I'd go back actually to that, those very first experiences that I had coaching. And so rather than it being if you like, within a pocket, it was within a project. So it was a project that the school had decided to invest time in. So, um, and you know, time is money. So they had, in, they, they may, it may be a funded project, but it still required a commitment to that work on developing teaching thinking skills in that case. And as a result of that, that didn't mean that every single member of staff 
at the same time was involved with the project because logistically that becomes difficult when you're trying to grow something. Um, but that actually over time that project would perhaps um, create more spaces for more members of staff to be involved. And the coaching work happened within the project. Um, and so therefore, again, uh, I mean, let's be honest, this is a long time ago before performance management was a particularly big deal. But certainly we still had conversations with our senior leaders about what we were doing and why and what we aimed to do the following year and why and how they might hold us, um, not to account so much, but check in with us on how that progress was going. It would be legitimate to talk about the project because the school had prioritised that work. So again, that notion of aligning it with a set of um, priorities and values that the school leaders, the school community choose to invest time and effort in means that whilst it may not be universal, the people who are engaging with it at a, a particular period of time have, have the license, if you like, to draw upon that as a major part of their, not just their professional development, but their professional identity and share what they're doing with others as a result. And, and the most recent experience I've got of that actually is working with a group of schools in um, North Yorkshire, a group of primary schools that had had um, that had been successful in winning a um, an S S I F bid. So, school improvement fund, self improvement fund, self improvement school. I don't school, school self improvement funding. Improvement. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was DFE money. Um, and this group of schools aligned to the Swaledale Teaching School Alliance had successfully been granted um, a significant amount of money to work for two years with a focus on um, maths teaching. Mm -hmm. And the focus within the maths teaching, interestingly, was metacognition, because what they'd had to do in order to secure the funding was to make sense of the evidence coming out of the Education Endowment Foundation a teacher toolkit which showed that metacognitive pedagogies were an effective way to uh, generate better outcomes for children and particularly uh, it, they were focused on schools with high numbers of children who came from families in the forces so they were on the garrisons they were or they were close to the garrisons and the what the funding was used for primarily was to employ a small group of coaches. They didn't call them coaches in the first instance. They, they called them advanced practitioners. I, I can't remember exactly what they called them. But what evolved over time as they started to work with, with a group of teachers across these 10 schools, not every single teacher, but a group of teachers across the 10 schools, was that the best way they could work with them to help them to really refine their practice in maths around pedagogy through metacognition was to adopt a range of coaching approaches. And over time, that allowed those individual teachers to then move into working more closely with their own colleagues, to have the sorts of coaching conversations that they'd had experience of in the first wave of the project. Yeah. And it wasn't a perfect project, none of these are, but it was a project which really started to build a capacity for conversations around teaching and learning. And interestingly, whilst the money was drawn down on the basis of this being about maths, actually the conversations around metacognition, because they were coaching type conversations, became quite um, expansive and actually started to develop and form practices in other areas other than maths. Okay, so, so that's really interesting. And, and I guess what, what um, is coming clear to me from, from, our, from our conversation here is that we're talking about two different, two different traits or two different pathways for coaching. One, um, a coaching, a culture and coaching types of conversations, which you may have in a professional dialogue that isn't necessarily um, falling within the parameters of a one-to-one -one contracted conversation, which you might have in a, in, in a coaching conversation, which is specifically around someone's development. And I think um, I'm just looking at some of the Q&As that are coming through and, and Nick has just raised something that, that is a really useful point um, in, about confidentiality. And certainly when you've got a one-to-one um, -one conversation that you're having within coaching, 
there is absolutely confidentiality and agreement between two parties about not sharing what is discussed within that conversation. And then on the other hand, you might be having a, a coaching conversation in a, like a learning tribe, which I referred to, or you're talking about in the mass, um, the mass metacognition um, type of conversation where you might be having a coaching conversation that isn't necessarily within the bounds of that confidentiality because it is more around sharing practice and developing skills. Do, do you see a difference between those two? Yes, I do. Um, and I think, you know, one, uh, at one point in the past, Christian and I um, gave a, a keynote as a dialogue keynote, and we talked about the spectrum of coaching and mentoring. But actually, what we really have in coaching is a, is a kind of kaleidoscope as well. So um, we, we, have, we have those formal episodes of coaching, which are usually sustained um, over a period of time, and as you say, bounded by some form of contract. And what you would anticipate is that the person who works as a coach has, has the, if you have the credentials, the qualifications, the experience to really get the best outcomes for the individual who is being coached mm -hmm. from those conversations to help that individual make the most of that opportunity. And, and they are not bound by an agenda. They are not part necessarily of a project. They are bound by this contract of coaching as a specific uh, practice but I think and, and I think there is a really uh, valuable place for those in schools but I think if we limit um, our coaching type conversations to those episodes that are bound by contract that are you know that are hopefully sustained but are not unlimited because there's a resource issue mm -hmm. uh, if we limit the kinds of conversations that we have that are coach like to those conversations then we are really um, limiting the opportunity for coaching as a, if you like, as a way of being. I know that's a GCI type phrase, but coaching is a way of being. Coaching is something that as a profession we can um, gain so much from. Um, we are not making the most of it if we become terrified by the idea that coaching can only happen within those contracted conversations. Okay, and that, that leads me into one of the things that I did want to um, to raise today was around the impact that the work that we have. And I guess the, the um, impact on within the schools and the, and the children. And what you've just described there around limiting it to certain episodes, I would imagine makes me think straight around, well, that's quite a narrow influence and impact that you're gonna have because it's just like one individual's sphere of influence. Whereas if you're adopting as an educational setting, as a school, you're adopting a much wider way of being and a way of having a, co a coaching, a dialogue and a coaching culture. The impact you're gonna have on those students is much, is much greater because you're, you're spreading that much wider. Um, and I guess my question for you would be, how do you see the impact of the work that you're having? even though you're not working in schools and you're working through educators, how do you see your impact or what would you like your impact to be within, within, um, within the settings that we're, we're working within? That's a really interesting question. And I, actually, let's just, I'm going to just go back to the comment that you made about the, the, imp, the potential impact of the one-to-one -one coaching if like bounded by that contract and there's the notion of the sphere of influence. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think you're, there's a, there's an interesting question that we should all ask ourselves actually about, well, what is my sphere of influence? Um, you could argue that if you're, if you're coaching somebody and it's working well, one of the outcomes may be that the sphere of influence of their practice grows. That yes, they may still have the same defined title and role within a school, Yes, they may still have the same timetabled lessons, so they're teaching the same number of kids, the same number of topics, you know, subjects. Um, and uh, therefore, if you like, practically, they are working in very similar confines. Um, but actually, as a, as a professional, they may have grown significantly in confidence. They may be the sort of person who now contributes much more in staff meetings, who um, initiates ideas, for developing practice, 
who has conversations more readily and more confidently outside of the school, you know, online, um, it, within network meetings, within. So actually, the sphere of influence I think we have um, cannot and shouldn't be defined simply by the people that we come into close contact with on our daily, in our daily routines as educators. And one of the things I think which characterizes, um, you know, really um, successful, happy professionals in, in education is knowing that you can't know everything about your sphere of influence, knowing that you will have a legacy that is unknown and being comfortable and confident with that and working within that kind of mushy area in a way where you, you, you gain insight into the positive effect you have, but you don't worry about measuring that positive effect because it's, it's unknowable. <laughs> that makes uh, me feel hopeful about the people that I might have influenced that I didn't know that I did, hopefully in a positive way. <laughs> and I mean, it's a simple thing, like people come across, I mean, this will happen to all sorts of people on, on, on social media, for example, you suddenly, somebody pops into your timeline and says, I remember when you, Mm -hmm. And you're thinking, who are you? What well, you've got a different married name. I have no idea who you are. And in a way, it doesn't matter mm -hmm. because actually, it might have been a single conversation you had with somebody. It might have been had a single, uh, you know, in my case, a lecture where you, it, instead of it just being a lecture, you you encourage conversations between participants that perhaps even within a five minute episode create a coaching moment because of the way you frame that conversation. Those things you cannot possibly worry about. You just have to know that there is potential to have that, that wider influence and that impact. We are um, very concerned about measuring and being held to account. And that is not to say that we shouldn't be good at the work we do and that it shouldn't be obvious that that good exists and that the impact is real. Um, but sometimes I think we worry about whether we can find that golden thread between one you know, series of coaching conversations and a particular predetermined set of desirable outcomes and that, and that I think perhaps is I mean that I can say that because I'm not sitting worrying about a school improvement plan I'm not in charge of a department worrying about whether my department's results are as good as they were last year yeah. I do appreciate I had the luxury of sitting back and saying that important. yeah sorry no I, I do appreciate that and I, and I do think that and maybe I've, I've certainly um, educationally as, as an educator grown up through the time when when data and analysis is right through my core and it, it is it is it's constantly a, a pull and a push to think how one can present oneself and how one can um, think about and I really like what you said about the sphere of influence because you're absolutely right you, you don't know and my my it's a good reflection back to me that that impact doesn't always have to be something that you can measure and you can see it can be the impact that reaches out um that you aren't even aware of and also that is unlikely to be immediate you know it's it's mm. not likely to happen within a predetermined time span um, and that is not to say that if you're working for example in a pedagogical coaching relationship that you wouldn't want wouldn't expect some changes in pedagogical practice within the short term. But if it's only short term, if it's just a burst of activity as a result of the last coaching conversation, that impact is going to be extraordinarily limited. Yeah. If, it's, yeah. if it's slower burn, if it's actually about digging uh, beyond the performance of teaching or the performance of leadership to the, to the knowledge base that's required and the ways that you have of gaining additional knowledge, um, and also to the values that you dig through and you draw upon when you're working as an educator. If the coaching conversations allow you to explore those, articulate those, um, you know, adjust some of those on occasion, then they are likely to have a legacy that is not just quick and immediate. It's much more likely to be sustained. Okay. So I'm going to pause for a second, if I may, because we have a number of questions. Um, and, and there's some that I think really... Um, would would, would uh, be interesting for all. So David Rouse, Rouse, Rousel, forgive me if I pronounced that incorrectly. Um, his question is, shouldn't the aim of coaching schools be the collective good, i.e. the sphere of influence is not a semi-accidental byproduct, but an actual aim? Yeah, I, I would agree that, it, you know, to be fair, I don't think we should limit for the collective good to coaching. 
you know, the aim of anything that we do in school should be for the collective good. And that's not to dismiss, you know, the right of an individual to a fantastic education and to gain the qualifications that they're, that they are, um, you know, that they have the capacity to gain. And it's not to deny the right of an individual teacher to set their career path and to, to gain satisfaction through, you know, through knowing that they individually are excellent in their work or are, or are working well or are aiming for a particular job in the future and are successful in that job. But the, all of those things, the individual's qualifications, the individual's career path, are part of the role of education for the collective good. So coaching has to be about that as well. It can't, it, it, otherwise it can start to feel and seem like a bit of a selfish act which sounds very strong, but I think, you know, given the resources are limited, it can seem like it's quite a selfish act um, because it's about me developing rather than about me developing for the collective good. Um, or it can seem like a bit of a luxury that can easily be dropped when budgets get tight or time gets tight or priorities shift. So I think, yeah, collective good is, is a worthy ambition for all of the things that we do in education and therefore coaching as well. I think one of the nice things about coaching is it really can be for the collective good. Yeah. It, we can see, we can start to see that happening. Okay. All right. I have, I have a question here, which I think is, is, is quite an interesting one. Um, and, and a useful, a useful use of language for us to be able to respond to. So this is from Kerry Jordan Dars. Um, and the question is managing perform performivity through development of a coaching cult. Is this an oxymoron? Oh, so conformity through a development of a coaching cult is this an oxymoron yes i can see that question thank you kerry <laughs> quite like to, to to ask kerry what she means by the question because it's a very um interesting one i i i'm yeah i'm very aware that we run the risk of coaching becoming a bit of a cult that again strong words but i think you know we often talk about fads um, and the problem with those is that if we get en enough people kind of jumping onto them, then those people, if you like, become the, become the visionaries, become the missionaries almost of a practice which might be deemed to be um, an ideal and then practiced in a way that disregards the other things that can work well. I, that's the bit I can make sense of in relation to the coaching cult. My, um, <laughs> okay. Carrie, Carrie, I'm going to talk to you later. No, Carrie, Carrie has just jumped in saying she meant a coaching culture, but I actually quite like the fact that you raised that. <laughs> I quite like the fact that you raised that, Carrie, because because I, Rachel and I sometimes do talk about coaching and, and fads and things, and so for me that was quite a provocative question as it was originally written. So so thank you. That, that you know, I think that, Kerry that, now owes us a working paper on the difference between a coaching <laughs> culture and a coaching cult. The collective ed, without a doubt. <laughs> okay, so let, let me scroll down. Like there, there's a lot of questions here, so I just want to give some <laughs> opportunity to, um, to to jump in with some. So again, around linking with performance management, and, and um, this is from Ellie Smith. Do you see that an instructional approach to coaching can carry the bias of performance management and or top-down approach? If yes, how can schools avoid this? Okay, so there's, a, there's an interesting dimension there. So bringing in the notion of instructional approach to coaching or instructional coaching, and of course, um, that, that's... Um, just because we can label something doesn't mean that we all practice it in the same way or that we all mean the same thing by it. Um, so I think there's probably quite a lot of variation in what we currently see um, in England under the label of instructional coaching or coaching for instruction, um, as in coaching for teaching and learning pedagogy. Um, I think um, I'm just scrolling back down to the question because it was a good one. Where did it go? Focusing around. Um top down as well it was about the, the, uh, my interpretation of it was how using coaching from a top down approach for performance management how, how successful that can be and my, my instant response to that would be that it would be quite a challenge 
I think that if you've got in a school anything that comes top down, you need to be very careful about how that is implemented um, for, for, for many, many reasons. We haven't really got time to discuss here now, but for the obvious ones. Um, and I think that it's it goes back to that some of the thinking that I've I've certainly had around coaching since since I've been more involved in it is about the cultural coaching within a school. I've done some work with um, um, a coaching in, in a, a school in, in Belgium that, that have really impressed me with the way that they have taught and thought about how co coaching is going to be embedded across their organization. And it's very much come from um, some champions who really believed in coaching as a way a way of being so it's both the one-to-one -one coaching that we've talked about around the sphere of influence and those things which i think really resonated today alongside um the, the coaching culture and about having coaching conversations and so you approach things in a coaching way and they've really taken their time to think about how they're going to implement and use coaching right the way across the school and it's a one school approach so it is it's an approach that in, in, in is very inclusive so it's not just for teaching it is around all staff so it might be, might be the security team that 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 um you know that that are, that are on the ground it might be the grounds team it might be the, the 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 canteen team it really is a way of thinking how can we change the culture the way we talk to each other so that we are thinking about it about those conversations in a way that is developing the individual and we are approaching things in a way that is from a solution focused positive approach mm -hmm. um so for me when you're looking at that compared to coming top down, I think you get very different outcomes. Yeah, and I would certainly agree. Um, and it's, so again, it's that notion of, um, that, so for example, it, it, the, the work on metacognition, the coaching around metacognition, both going back to my old days, but also this, this, this practice in Swaledale, that could have seemed like a relatively instructional approach as in there's a predetermined set of uh, ways that have been agreed that metacognition should be implemented in these maths classrooms. And actually the role of the coach is to um, enable the teacher to demonstrate that they're learning those ways, they're confident in those ways, and they are um, performing in such a way that somebody up the chain would deem to be appropriate. Now, I don't believe that's what the original instructional coaching work is about. I think the original instruction, instructional coaching work is about really focusing on the quality of teaching and learning, paying really close attention to the individual teacher and that individual class so that the solutions that become apparent through coaching are bespoke and are unique but are also personalized so that that individual teacher can carry them with them into other settings. And I think the key thing for me here is this difference between developing a practice in order to prove you've developed it. Because at some point um, in the chain of command, it's been deemed to be the right way to, to practice. And that's not to say I'm always, I'm, I'm not cynical. I'm not saying there are no good ways of teaching and learning. Of course there are. But, but there's a difference between developing a practice in order to prove you've developed it and developing a practice in order to learn as a professional more about the richness of teaching and learning practices. And if, if there is a period of time, for example, in a school where there's a focus on teaching reading in a particular way and there's a coaching mechanism that supports teachers to focus on teaching reading, that's fine as long as what that doesn't do is obliterate an understanding of a range of effective ways of teaching reading that that teacher will need to take with them into different classroom settings and into different policy settings and into different educational settings over time. So that would that's the bit that worries me a bit about the link between instructional coaching as it might be defined and performance management. I think it's about seeing coaching as a means to really enhance the professional repertoire skill set and knowledge that our teachers will carry with them not just show they can perform the next time they're observed mm. or the next time they go to a meeting and have to report back okay all right i i i, I pause there because we're, we're we're short of time we've we've got a um a lot of questions that are um coming through and i think i think think we'll be able to answer some of those um, 
later on and put them through on the on on the webinar as it comes out but i had a couple that were sent before the actual webinar started and there's one that, that really um i i did want to discuss with you before i come to my last question for you and it was in your experience of what you've seen and, and we all have limited experience yours is wider than the most but it's still limited in the sense you haven't been to, to every school which has a coaching um a coaching policy if you like the question was, what is the most effective area of secondary school education where you think coaching has the biggest impact and why is it so effective there? So that is, what is the most effective area of secondary school education where you think coaching has the biggest impact and why is it so effective there? That is a hard question and it is one that I saw as well before we started today. And um, I, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm loath to pinpoint something and it feels like that's a cop out, but I'm loath to pinpoint something because I don't think we can suggest that all secondary schools are in the same situation, have the same um, staffing structure, the same level of expertise, the same um, community that they're serving the same you know I, every secondary school is unique and therefore uh, it's unlikely that across the board there would be the single most appropriate focus for coaching even if we just define it as in secondary schools okay and I wouldn't disagree with that but so mm -hmm. my question <laughs> would be the next one and I'm, I'm jumping in because I know we're short of time now would be okay so if i'm a secondary school and i'm wanting to look at coaching what questions would i need to ask myself other than that one that we originally posed which was if coaching is the answer what is the question so if i'm if i've got a secondary school and i'm thinking right where should i start if i'm going to start somewhere how do i find out where to start maybe that's the question how do i find out where to start well i think a really important question to ask yourself is your if you're leading a complicated organization like a secondary school is what what resources do we have internally? What skill sets? What, what, um, who amongst our staff may already be working in this way, perhaps even without it being defined as coaching like? Um, who amongst our staff have the capacity, um, if given enough time and support, to become um, the sorts of coaches that we want? So, whether that's to do with developing middle leadership or whether that's to do with developing pedagogy or whichever aspect of the school work seems to be most in need of some additional attention and focus and leverage. The first question is, have we actually got the internal capacity given some additional support and training to really make the ground up, to really make gains? If, we, if that doesn't seem reasonable, then it's then important to ask who from the outside can bring in some expertise. Um, so there's a, there's a, Neither of those is cost neutral. Both of them involve a, a, a different set of decisions around the investment that you make. But if you, I think the, the last thing you want to do is impose external coaching on staff who've actually got the capacity to be good coaches within the setting. Um, but on the other hand, misunderstanding the capacity for staff to be good coaches and also for the school system to support them to do that um, is also a flawed um, kind of line to go down. We, we, know, we see that in schools all the time, that they, they go through spurts of activity with coaching, particularly internal coaching, and then it dies down again. Because actually what they didn't understand was whether the capacity was there to really make it work and make it effective. Okay. So there are a number of questions to ask yourself, and it's, it, it, nowhere's a perfect place to start. It's a complicated web, um, but you have to start somewhere. Okay. And I guess that's, I, I asked that because it's the, around a secondary school, because that's what the question was framed in. But I guess that would apply to any school settings, whether it's a special mm. school or a primary school or a, an earlier school. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, da, 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 da. I'm just going to scroll down the questions. Is there any that I think are short based that we can see that we can fit mm -hmm. in? I'm having a look as well. <laughs> okay. <laughs> really nice to see the names, isn't it? It's nice to know who's out there. Ashok has asked an interesting question. Okay. Whether a school leader can perform effectively as a coach within their school 
or does their position in the hierarchy make this too difficult? That's an interesting question. Yeah, I, I, from my perspective, I think it, it's, it, again, it depends on the individual and it depends on, on the boundaries and, and, and the culture and the, the contracting that you put in place. Um, I certainly felt that when I, I was coaching within the different organizations that I've worked with, both in uh, the charity, educational charity, but also when I was working uh, across a range of schools in London, the, the, the when, once you've established your relationship and you have those parameters set and you are actively all the time thinking about coaching being a, an equal relationship, so it is, it is things such as, it's a silly example, but it's one that really displays it very well, is that when you're going into, um, say you're working in, a, in a, a primary school setting and you as the coach comes in and sits on an adult chair and the coachee might be sitting on one of the baby ch school children chairs, there's automatically a difference in height and that therefore automatically puts a non-equal part to the relationship. And so thinking about those sorts of things when you're coming in, as a coach, even if you are more senior in that hierarchy to the person that you're coaching, I think if you really pay attention to those sorts of things, you can make the relationship very equal. I think certain things have to be very open, have to be very clear. I, I certainly believe in, in calling things out and naming it. And so you actually talk around the things that might get in the way. Um, having said all that, if you've got a senior leader who is using coaching as a leverage with his, his or her junior colleagues, then that can be completely not what it's all about. It's really not a, a, good, a good tool to be able to do that. So again, it, it, it refers back to what we said earlier, it very much depends on the different school setting and the different ways that you're, you're working and operating. Um, but I certainly think it can work if all of the things that, that you're thinking around coaching are really given the due attention that is needed. Mm -hmm. I've certainly been coached the other way around by a junior colleague um, and I know that when they, they started coaching and coaching me, we really had to set out very early on about that equal relationship. And it took a lot of, of, of openness and honesty from me to make them feel that they were in a position to be able to coach me. And it, and it worked really well. It did work really well. But we really had to name it and think through the barriers that might potentially be there to make that a productive, productive um, coaching relationship. It's also, I think, um... Uh, culturally quite interesting because I think those of us that work in England um, assume often that schools around the world have similar hierarchical structures to the ones that we have in England mm. um, and and actually most of us would recognize that the hierarchical structures in many schools in England have, have grown significantly you know they've ex ex um, got more more um, yeah, more structure and, and, and not necessarily in a bad way, but there is more of it. There are more, there are more uh, positions, more roles, more responsibilities, more line management relationships, et cetera, et cetera, than there perhaps were 20 years ago. But of course, in many schools, in many other parts of the world, there is much, much flatter structure in terms of hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And it, so we, when we're answering a question like that, there's, there's just always that consciousness that, it may not look and feel the same in the different countries mm -hmm. uh, where different schools work well, and, that, and yeah. themselves in different ways. Yeah. Um, but also that notion that you know we we do exist we do exist in England in, in a hierarchical structure in schools. But one of the questions we can ask ourselves is is that always the most productive way to work? And it might be an important way to work because it allows people to gain career progression and to gain uh, mm -hmm. you know, pay rises, et cetera. And that's a, in that respect, it's a very humane way to work. It gives people opportunities. Um, but that doesn't necessarily mean that every relationship that we have with each other in the school should be grounded in the hierarchy. Mm -hmm. The hierarchy is part of the school, but it doesn't have to be part of every human relationship that we have. Rachel, you know what? You always bring me back. You're great. That's really <laughs> such a, a really helpful insight because it, we do see things through our own lens. And so I really, really appreciate you, you, you drawing and, and on your own experience and knowledge to make that seem a bit, bit wider. Listen, I'm really mindful that we, we, we've only got, I'm just 
Michael, we've got a minute left. <laughs> one minute left. So I, just thank you so much. It's been fantastic. And the one question I was going to ask you that I haven't really got a chance to know, so, so maybe I'll leave this resonating with you, is if I was to be speaking with you this time next year, what would you like to be seeing, hearing, or sharing, or presenting? And that, Do that, you know, that's such an interesting question because of where we are this year. Yes. It's a huge interruption, disruption to education systems globally. Um, it, you know, the identity crisis that teachers are going through in relation to what is the priority that they should be focusing on and school leaders, the tensions, the opportunities, the challenges, that it makes thinking ahead of a year really quite difficult and challenging. But what, what I'd like to what I'd like to feel, and this is not about making hay when you know there's a real crisis, this is about saying we have had so much of our work and our understanding of how and why we work disrupted and let's at least hope that in a year's time that's given us a moment to reflect on how things like coaching can play a really productive part in how we recreate the schools that we need for the future fantastic great way to end super talking to you and um we will speak soon we will thank you very much thank you thanks so much